right, hello everybody. We're here with um, another lecture. This time we're gonna be talking about um, just some modern trends in, in, op in uh, opening studies. And uh, I've noticed that over the past maybe five years or so, maybe 10 at most, uh, the way that top level players are approaching the opening has, has changed dramatically. Remember like when I was a kid and, and uh, sort of first starting out in the late 90s, it seemed like there were these players that were just married to their openings. Like, okay, these guys would play the Night Orf against King Pawn, they would play the King's Indian or the Grumfeld against Queen Pawn, and what determined your success or failure in the opening was, okay, how far into the opening are you able to to sort of study, memorize, understand, and like, there was these, uh, you, you had to be familiar with typical end games and typical tactical themes. So it was really kind of a, uh, a length, uh, your success was determined by the amount of moves that you knew. And that's not really what's, what's going on now. I think that approach has been tapped out and you rarely see players, um, sticking to that. I would say probably the, the one the holdout is MVL, Maxime Bashir Lagraf. He still plays his Nidorf and his Grumfeld religiously, but he's been struggling a lot over the past few years. I mean, he used to be one of the most successful players with the Nidorf, and I can't remember the last time he won a Nidorf, honestly. Uh, in fact, there was this Vikonze, I think it wasn't last year, maybe it was the year before, where he played like three Nidorfs back to back to back and lost them back to back to back. And it was just like, you gotta change something there. Cause it wasn't like he was winning and blundered. He just got crushed every game. So what does opening preparation entail today? Well, if you look at some of the most popular openings right now, maybe to the disappointment of many fans that enjoy, you know, crazy tactical games. I mean, what, what would be the, the openings that stand out to you, like that you just see most commonly in practice? Anybody care to take a shot? Okay, so you see the Grunfeld quite often. Um, anything else? I mean, there's, I would say the Grunfeld, if not for, something that white can do to kind of avoid the groom field. What, like, let's say you're playing with black and your opponent, what would be the thing that would bother you the most? What's that thing when you sit down, you're like, oh, I hope he doesn't do this thing. We all have that opening, right? That bothers us that we're just like, I don't want to deal with this today. Well, for me, one of them is the London, right? The London ha it happens all the time, and uh, it, it gets this kind of bad reputation. And that was the image I had of it. I was like, okay, the London is the lazy man's opening. It's an opening that, you know, you don't have to study theory. Uh, it kind of just tells you where your pieces need to go. And, you know, it's an unpretentious opening. You just get out of the opening with an equal position and you play, right? That was my impression of the London. And I was completely wrong. The London is about so much more than that. In fact, I decided to start trying it out myself with absolutely disastrous results. So um, that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. I wanted to talk a little bit about the London, but to use it as an example of a much broader thing that's going on currently in opening theory, which is that players are more interested in choosing little subtleties early on in the game, right? They want to outplay you or trick you very soon. They're not looking to engage with you in, in, in some kind of competition of who can rattle off the most moves. That's not really what's going on anymore. So the London is a perfect example of that. You have the Italian is another perfect example of that um, with black. You have um, the Karo Khan is another good example of that. Um, but anyway, 
We're going to use the London as our case study for today. And I'm going to be using, uh, hold on, can you see the moves there? Can I like, um, yeah, just so that the moves get, get blocked. Is that possible? Yeah, I'll get, I'll get to it. Okay. So anyway, in my game, this is from the Spring Classic that, um, that ended just a little bit over a week ago maybe two weeks ago, uh, where I was white against a player from India, a grandmaster named uh, Raja Harshit, and uh, after knight f6, knight f3, d5, bishop f4, e6, we get our basic starting position of the London. There are many different approaches that black can take here. e6 is by no means forced. Uh, in fact, um, as, as black, I would often avoid playing e6. What's going on? It's playing games with me. I would often avoid playing... Are you guys seeing this? Yeah. Okay, it's not... Like I, I make a move and then it's, it's like I don't, I don't like your move and it takes it back. This happened a few times with Dorsey too. Really? I don't know what the... Maybe it's because my, my file is too loaded. Um, let's see if I, yeah, that's 2,000 moves. Okay, let's see if it takes it now. No. Huh. Yeah, the, the instance that she encountered was it was, um, Lee Chess would not let her input any more moves uh, that were deviations from what she had already entered. Uh-huh. All right, so if, if I delete some, it should let me. We never solved it. Uh, oh, that's that's promising. Yeah, just the next night it worked again. Okay. It didn't seem to matter how large the study was. Um, uh huh. It's interesting. Not good. It's not good. Not good. So, oh, remove the sink. You're saying? Maybe. Let's see. Is it taking it? No. So wait, if I, let's say, add a new chapter, will it do it there? Well, it seems to work here. So I'll just have to rely on my flawless memory <laughs> for those like 2,000 variations I had saved there. Um, all right, we'll see. I think I can pull it off. Anyway, so we'll get around to E6 in just a moment. But I was mentioning the move c5, because if we're going to talk about the London, we might as well just do a general overview of what's out there. Now, the point of c5, uh, when you compare it to e6, is that black is attempting to solve the problem of this bishop in a much different way. Like, whenever you go e6 in d4, d5 openings, whenever you go e6, sorry, it's not like you're giving up on this bishop and saying, sorry, you know, I tried. Uh, you're actually planning on developing the bishop to b7. So these are two different approaches. It really depends where you believe the bishop's going to have uh, more potential, if outside the pawn chain or inside. Um, but after something like knight bd2, one of black's ideas is to take on d4 and go bishop f5. So I think black is very close to equalizing here if not for very interesting move that white has here, which is bishop b5. So this is currently the problem that black is facing in this line. Many times, because white's going to go uh, knight e5, c4, queen a4, and there's some substantial pressure on c6. The other line that you'll probably see a lot of games uh, being played is the move queen b6, which historically, well, I mean, historically, like over the past couple of years, has been uh, the go-to move for black. And the point is that after d takes, queen takes b2, um, rook b1, queen c3, and bishop b5, we get a very messy position where it looks like white's queen side has been completely decimated. But white has a substantial lead in development and some very interesting ideas. For example, uh, ideas like playing castles and e4. It really depends what black does. Black has two plans, g6, which was recommended by Sam Shankland, 
I think a couple of years ago in a course he did uh, for Chessable, very interesting move. Then you have e6, but anyway, um, there was a very nice game played at last year's US Seniors, uh, a tiebreak game between Greg Kaidanov and Larry Christensen, where Kaidanov, I don't know if he had prepared the whole thing or not, but he just played this, this brilliant game with black, right? So Larry was playing white, and Kaidanov just masterfully uh, handled the black side and, and won a, a very clean game. So queen b6 is one of the key lines that's currently like at the foreground of the discussion. So in this game, my opponent decided to play with the bishop inside of the pawn chain. And uh, now after e3, he played bishop d6. Now, I would say that the queen b6 variation and this variation with bishop d6 are the two main lines. Uh, these are the, if you play the London with white, these are the two lines that you need to start with because not only are they the most common, they're also the most critical. So this was thought to be absolutely um, harmless for black for many, many years. In fact, what would be some of, what moves could, could white play here? I mean, uh, what would you guys play if you had this position with white? Okay, so bishop g3 by far um, the most natural move. Any other moves? It's funny because bishop g3 is the only harmless move in the position. And it's the move that used to be played just systematically until Lanier Dominguez won a brilliant game against Gatakamsky. Gatakamsky, by the way, I'm going to go out on a limb and say he is single-handedly responsible for revitalizing the London system. I mean, after Gata made his comeback from uh, ret retirement in the mid-2000s, he came back with some really fresh ideas. I mean, he would play this, um, uh, the Chebanenko Slav, right? This Slav with G6, kind of like a, a, a hybrid between Grunfeld and Slav. He won many nice games. And then he started playing the London system. Won many nice games, still continues to win many nice games, but not many people sort of picked up with the Chebanenko Slav, but everybody got on board with the London. So why is bishop g3 harmless here? Well, in the old days, it was thought, OK, black plays c5, and after c3, knight c6, normal moves, uh, maybe castles, bishop d3, and b6. And I played this many, many times with black. My idea was, well, if white castles after bishop b7, um, White's going to do something like knight e5, maybe, and after queen c7, f4. And white's very close to getting a dangerous attack on the king side. White's going to go bishop h4, queen f3, g4, and so on. But black has a wonderful maneuver to punish white for weakening the e4 square. That maneuver is uh, knight e7. And I think after queen f3, knight f5, and after bishop f2, the key move is this quiet retreat by the bishop, allowing the knight to come to d6, and if you keep pushing, then I've sort of recycled all of my pieces to really pound away at the e4 square. So, so this position is considered to be really good for black. But something happened here. Right? White realized, I don't have to do any of this. Instead, white began experimenting with the move e4, threatening e5. And it was thought that black could simply play bishop e7. And now, after e5, knight h5. And 
Once white castles, black will take on g3 and have a very comfortable game. Uh, of course, you don't want to take before because then you might open up the h-file for the rook and this would be dangerous. But then, and I remember I, I, I was playing, uh, it was one day, like at 3 a.m., and I was just playing Blitz online. And I'm like, oh, this guy's playing the London uh, piece of cake. And he plays this line, and here he plays the move knight g5 against me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I think I just walked into something. The point being that after bishop takes g5, queen takes h5, g6, you can see why white didn't want to castle, because white wants to create a hook here that he can take advantage of with h4, h5. Now this does involve a pawn sacrifice, right? after c takes d4, h4, bishop h6, h5. And this position is a total mess, but you'll have to take my word for it that this is incredibly dangerous for black. Even if you do something like this, no problem. I mean, white's going to... Uh, well, depends on what you do, right? If you go bishop g7, many times white will actually play against the bishop on h8. White could go like f4, knight f3, bishop h4. Um, if white does something like g4, g5, you're, you're basically going to be down a bishop for the rest of the game. So anyway, this is the current problem that black... Well, it was the problem that black was facing until Lanier Dominguez sort of found a way around it. Now what he did is he said, I shouldn't hurry up developing this knight on b8. Instead I'm going to castle and after knight bd2 I'm going to go queen c7 and after bishop d3 I'm going to go knight bd7 and the point is that black is fighting for this e5 square very quickly. For example, if you castle now, then black simply goes e5. And the London system, for all its subtleties and, and numerous lines, you can boil it down to one simple idea. Whoever wins the battle for the e5 square is going to win the opening battle, period. So, Black is going to try really hard to play e5, and white's going to try really hard for that not to happen. Usually, white's going to try by playing like knight e5 and f4, like we just saw. But this would be a perfect example of black realizing his opening goals. Uh, so I think Kamsky in the position might have played something like a4. I don't re really remember so well. But... Um, but he got nothing out of the opening, and he, he actually lost, uh, I would say, very convincingly. And that's pretty much why bishop g3 has experienced a substantial decrease in popularity. So it was thought that, okay, London is done. They, they finally cracked the code. But it was nowhere near uh, done, actually. And here, white has a couple of really interesting choices to bishop uh, g3. The one I played in the game, knight bd2, I think is, is very interesting, despite my, my horrendous sort of handling of it. And the other idea, and I would say very closely related to knight bd2, uh, in fact it often leads to transpositions, is knight e5. Right? A move that makes sense if we understand how important the e5 square is and is going to be. So. Let me ask you guys a question. What do you think about this change in the pawn structure, right? Because this would seem like the obvious question after knight bd2. Yeah? Okay, so we absolutely have improved our control over e5, not just because of the pawn on f4, but when we go bishop d3, castles, and rook e1, we'll also have the e-file, right? So I remember in the beginning, people would cringe when they would see this structure. They would say, oh, but doubled pawns. I mean, <laughs> these doubled pawns are, are untouchable, right? Because 
Worst case scenario, you just go G3 and defend it. And uh, these pawns are doing a phenomenal job at making up for your dark square bishop, right, for being traded off. So you don't even feel that bishop gone. So this, I think, is the kind of pawn structure that black should try to avoid at all costs. Um, in fact, I, I was looking, I remember when I was preparing for this game, I was looking at some positions like this, for example. And it turns out that these two squares are really ideal squares for the white knights. White's plan is going to be to play something like c3, bishop d3, knight b d4, knight e5, maybe castles, queen e2. It's like all white's pieces find beautiful squares, and, and the position has this natural flow to it. So uh, this is really the whole point behind knight bd2, is to try to get that pawn structure. Um, knight e5 obviously kind of sidesteps all of that, and instead aims, number one, to, to really establish a firm grip over e5, sometimes playing you know, knight d2, knight df3, but also clearing the diagonal for the queen and preparing for a possible initiative on the king side, maybe based on h4, h5, g4, g5. So um, I thought knight e5 was interesting, but then I, I started to see some issues with it. For example, I think after castles, knight d2, c5, c3, and queen c7. I think this was one of the critical positions. And um, one of the things I failed to grasp during the game were the subtleties. For example, it might seem natural to play bishop d3, but there are some cases where you, you want to delay this move. And uh, white does have other useful moves. So if you sketch out what white's plan is, right? What are all the moves that white wants to play? Obviously, bishop d3 is one of them. But white might want to go h4, h5. White might want to go queen f3. White might want to go knight d f3. So whenever you have a plan that involves several moves, the hard part is deciding, OK, which move should I start with? And usually, the way that you're going to answer that question is by playing the move that's most flexible, that not only avoids closing the door for one of the other moves, but actually opens the door for maybe some new moves. So for example, um, let's say I go bishop d3, right? After bishop d3, my next moves are going to be maybe h4, maybe knight df3. But if I start with h4, now I'm also introducing a new idea. Yes, I could go bishop d3 and knight df3, right? Two moves that were already part of my plan. But I've also opened the door for my h-pawn to keep advancing. So now I've got yet another move that's part of my plan, right? So I'm broadening my my sketch of possible moves. And that's really what you want out of the opening. You want flexibility, you want options. So um, I think probably h4 here would be the right or the most accurate move. And we're going to see why you need to be careful about developing the bishop to d3 too soon. So in my game, I played knight bd2. Uh, Black castled, and we're going to see that uh, this is going to be very similar. I played knight e5, and my opponent played b6. This move actually surprised me a little bit. I wasn't expecting this move. I was really just expecting black to play you know, c5, c3, and queen c7, and take it from here. But b6, I think... Um, I think black is playing the same game that I am. And that's why you see incredibly strong players defending both sides of this position, because there are a lot of little subtleties or, or 
tricks in that that are based on your understanding of the position rather than your memorization of it. Uh, if you try to memorize these openings, you're gonna drive yourself crazy. So I played um, the move bishop d3 here, and after c5, c3, queen c7. And now I played h4. And I think h4 now is actually a dubious move. So what reason could there be for, in one scenario, playing h4, and it's absolutely fine, right? A scenario where the bishop's on f1, as opposed to the other one where the bishop's on d3. How could this possibly be a bad thing for white? Any ideas? How so? Knight B to D7, and uh, uh, yeah. I don't. I'm not sure if I should go Knight D to F3 or if I need to take on D7. But my initial reaction would be to play something like this. Yeah. So, what would your follow-up? B. Um, knight takes, um, knight takes knight, and then uh, knight two. Wait, wait, wait! Be careful, because I might take this way. Oh, sorry. Oh, so bishop takes this way. But it, if you take with the bishop, then you're really giving up on your dark squares, right? So I could just take this way and say, okay, you know, yeah. bishop pair. I think this is a dream come true for white. So that's not exactly what white is afraid of. I think white has a strong enough grip over e5. Uh, in the chat here, they, they're, they're right on the money. The point is to play bishop a6. And the problem with this move, I mean the problem for white, is that, well, you wasted a move, right, uh, by playing bishop d3 because you're probably going to have to take on a6 anyway. So after bishop takes a6, knight takes a6, I think black is actually absolutely fine here. So, uh, can I ask a quick question? Um, yeah. What would black do with the knight after that? Would, would so have... you mean after this? After bishop takes, knight takes? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like that. for example, if I attack the knight? Sure. Well, the knight's just gonna go back. So then, did white waste a move then? If black has to move the knight multiple times? Well, I think, I don't know how useful the move queen e2 is going to be for white. Uh, I mean, usually queen e2 is useful when the bishop's on d3 to stop bishop a6. But now that your bishop is gone, okay, your queen's on e2, how are you gonna continue as white? Let's say you go something like h5, right? Just to be consistent with your moves and and I stop the advance of your pawn with h6. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe you know you you start uh, attacking on the king side, but these can be pretty pretty tricky, pretty dangerous uh, for both sides because if g4 backfires for white, you know your king's in the center, you know your position's kind of shaky. Like let's say I go knight c6. Now you have to be careful, because if I go knight d to f3, maybe black's going to go knight e4. And now you have to start watching out for, for moves like f6. And if you don't have something amazing against f6, your entire position starts to collapse as white, because it's only a matter of time before black plays e5. Now, I would say that one of the main reasons, not the only reason, that white pushes the pawn to h5 is not necessarily because of his attacking ambitions, but because 
I don't know, I just want to make some kind of random move because against f6, now you're able to at least play knight g6. So by having a pawn on h5 and forcing the black pawn to h6, you, you take the sting out of f6, at least a little bit. Now, this is probably still a very good version for black, but, um, but the, pushing the pawn to h5 is, is one of those subtleties, right? It's one of those things that's gonna make black's idea less strong than it usually is. Now, it's not like this is devastating for white, right? I mean, like, like you saw, the game goes on. But what could white have played here instead of h4? Right? In order to argue that at least this, you know, this position is still, white can still fight for an advantage here. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is what I should have played. But I remember during the game, I was like, well, that's nonsense, right? Because black's just going to go a5, and bishop a6 is coming next anyway. But there are some important differences. And I mean, this is the bread and butter of the London system. If you play the London system or you want to play the London system, you can never say to yourself, oh, but this is like the same as before, like pawn on a5 is going to make no difference. These kinds of moves make all the difference in the London. Because now after bishop a6, bishop takes, knight takes. Having the pawn on a5 substantially weakens black's queen side. The b5 square is weak. The b6 pawn is weaker because it's not defended by the pawn on a7. And overall, um, white can now start to think about both sides of the board, right? White can say, okay, I, got a, I can get a pawn to h5. I can also try to put a queen on b5. Um, sometimes I've even seen white like castle kingside and, and play c4, maybe put a rook on c1 and, and try to open up the c-file. So white's position is very flexible. And the more flexible you can maintain it, usually the more resources you're going to have at your disposal. So to me, this is, this is one of those key ideas. Otherwise, the, the option is to go c3, right? And after c5, just h4, and after queen c7, you know, h5, h6, and just keep waiting. But I don't know who's going to run out of moves first, because if I don't want to play bishop d3, right, in the chat they're saying, just keep the bishop on f1 and, and wait for black to go bishop a6 and take. But, but how do I continue here, right? Because if I make some reckless moves, black might not play bishop a6, but he might just kick my knight out of e5, maybe knight fd7, maybe knight c6, and then knight d7. Although remember, with the pawn on h5, you always have this out, right? So it's not that serious. But anyway, let's see how black punished me for, for missing out on this subtlety, right? After queen c7, h4, bishop a6, bishop takes, knight takes. And here I didn't play queen e2, right? Because I said, oh, this, this knight looks... Looks pretty awful on a6, right? So why would I help chase it to a better square like c6 or d7, right? So that's kind of a first glance evaluation. It's kind of superficial. And um, sure enough, after h5, h6, this was pretty much my last chance to play queen e2, and I didn't take it. Here, I just played g4, and I decided to go for it. And, um, and after g4, white's position is, is basically busted. So I want to see if you guys can find uh, the correct approach for black.
So, so white is basically arguing with g4 that I've got the center on lockdown, right? I've got my knight on e5, so the center is not going to open up. And uh, that means I can take some license here to, to attack on the king side. So how can black make a counter argument to that and say, no, that's actually really wrong what you just said? Black attacked the queen side. How? With queen B, B5. B5, OK. All right, but let's say I, I keep going. Right, my idea is that if you take and then take on e5, it looks like you're, you're crushing me here. But these positions are tricky. I have, I have ideas like h6, I have ideas like rook g1 or knight f3. Um, let's say I'll start with this move. Right, uh, h6 is annoying and even if I don't have an immediate win, I'm probably just going to play like queen c2, castle, queen side, you know, rook g3, castles. Maybe the queen can stay on e2 just to keep an eye on h5. But once I castle queen side, I go rook g3 and double up on the g file. I mean, it's only a matter of time before black starts getting into some real trouble. Um, here in, in the chat, they're suggesting the move knight e4, which also makes a lot of sense, right? Preparing f6. But again, let's say. Let's say I take first, and now I go queen e2, right? Hitting the knight and maybe preparing to castle. Right? Do you ignore the knight? Do you retreat the knight back to b8? Do you play f6? I mean, if you go knight b8, I might have a similar idea, right? I might still be able to go g5. And if pawn takes, does this work? Right, takes, takes, and uh, now I'm, if, well, if you take, I'm just mating you, right? Here, here, <clears throat> and this is checkmate. <clears throat> so. Yeah, these g5 moves are very dangerous. Um, but if not, what do you do? I don't know. I don't really see that many good moves for black. Another move that's being suggested is knight h7. Now, this is something I was thinking about during the game. I was actually more worried with knight h7 than with knight e4 because it prepares f6, but it also holds back my g5 idea. Um, so here, I would have to maybe play knight f3 to reinforce e5. And here we can see that the f6 move, when there's a pawn on h5, really doesn't solve all of black's problems. Because I can go knight g6. I'm hitting your rook, right? If you go bishop takes f4, I don't know if I, maybe I can even do this. And because I'm attacking the knight as well, right? And the bishop, so I'm winning an exchange at least winning in exchange, but I could even again say, oh, I remember this pawn structure, right? It gives me good control over e5 and pressure on the e file. Now, for example, after rook e8, uh, maybe again I have this g5 move. So white's really rolling at this point. All of white's ideas are, are um, coming true, whereas black, not really getting that pawn to e5, right? So, so this is a, 
A critical position, I would say. What, what Black decides to do next is very important. Yeah, this is very tricky. But by the way, Black's next sequence is an idea I had never seen before. And after my game, I became convinced that it's probably one of the most important thematic ideas for Black. Right, so, so okay, here they're saying C takes D4, right? But let's say I just go E takes D4. Yeah, I got my, they picked up on the product placement. Ah, you guys, you got me. Yes, that's right, knight c5, right? So this is, this is really a key move, knight c5. It solves all of black's problems, right? The knight that was doing nothing now joins the game, doesn't just join the game, but now black is creating some concrete threats like bishop takes, bishop takes, and knight d3 check. And um, after I played queen e2, how, how should black follow up here? I mean, how can black really keep his foot on the gas? Why can't white just take over the pawn? Here? Yeah. Well, then black takes the knight on e5. Right, and, and I mean here, do you take on b6 first? Do you take on e5? Do you retreat the bishop? Okay. Let's say you go pawn takes, just to get this pawn off your hands. And then, you know, you take on e5. If I go queen e2, at the very least, I think black could take on e2 and take on g4, right? And he wins a pawn. This endgame should be winning for black, right? Because I even have this weak pawn on h5, black has open files for the rooks. This is just terrible, right? It's going to be very similar to what happened in the game, unfortunately. Um, so that's a problem, right? That's the whole basis of knight c5. So I played queen e2, thinking, okay, I just defend this knight, and then I'm threatening to take, and I thought, well, now he, he probably is going to go knight d7. And I thought, hey, you know, I'm just going to castle. I've got e5 covered. And now I can really focus my attention on trying to get g5 in. Of course, this is not what black has in mind. Knight c4? Can you be more specific? <laughs> Knight c to e4? Knight c to e4, okay. Um, And let's say I, can I kick your knight out? Maybe. Right, the point is that if knight takes d2, I can go queen takes d2, and you know, the fireworks are over and it looks like I'm more or less keeping things together. Black should be okay here. I mean, for example, if, if knight d7, knight d3, this, this was something I considered during the game. Um, but overall, I mean, White shouldn't be too upset with the way things turned out. But I think black has a much stronger move here. Any ideas? Actually, um, I kind of gave you a hint just now. What's, what's Black's most important uh, idea, right, in the London? Just let's break it down to, to the core principles because any opening strategy is simply um, layers upon layers of a very simple idea. You start with a simple idea and then you add layers to it, right? 
but you should always be able to trace your moves back to that sort of original idea. So what is the most basic fundamental uh, struggle that's going on in the London? Yeah, the e5 square, right? So how does black usually challenge the e5 square? And in fact, white has gone through great pains to make that as unappealing as possible to black. Is it other knights? Yes. And then, then counterattack with f6? Bingo. So knight f e4 followed by f6. And black is completely blowing up the center now. Notice that my g5 idea is so far remote here, like from ever happening, right? This is a devastating situation. This is exactly what white never wants to see happen. And once again, right, if, if d takes c5, bishop takes e5, this kind of transformation of the position or change in the pawn structure is, uh, is absolutely devastating for white because the entire queen, uh, king side is, um, is in shambles. Like it reminds me of some Karo Khan positions. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the knight c3 variation of the Karo Khan, but basically what black tries to do in that variation is to provoke white uh, to overextend his position. And then almost every single end game is, is a problem, right? So, here, I'm going to be lucky to even get to the end game, but I'm having, you know, serious issues keeping my king side together. So, so after knight f e4, here I remember thinking for a long time and thinking, okay, this feels like a key moment where it's going to be like my last chance to save this game. Uh, so I have to get this right. I can't, I'm, I'm already like full count, you know, two strikes, uh, except not full count because he probably has like no balls or anything like that. So, you know, he's got plenty of wiggle room, but I'm, I've only got one last shot here. So how do I solve this problem, right? I've got f6 coming. I can't really take on c5. What do we do? What are some candidate moves? Actually, this is a good place to start, right? When you have a complex position in front of you, I mean, look at all the tension that we have here. I mean, this can get taken, this can get taken, this can get taken, this is coming. There's a lot going on here. So this would definitely qualify as a complex position. And in order to wrap your head around what's going on and eventually arrive at the right move to play, you have to start by outlining what your options are, right? So, and only then start analyzing, comparing them and say, okay, this one's better than this one, therefore this one's out, right? And then start a sort of process of elimination. So, we already started with d take c5, right? And uh, this didn't look too promising. But before we rule it out, we need a better option, right? You're, when you're playing a chess game, you're not trying to find a good move. You're just trying to find the best move out of the options that you have, right? So you need to be kind of like a machine in that way. You, you, you shouldn't have these expectations of what your position should look like, right? You should just be saying, okay, I can play these three moves. This one's better than that one. Okay, this one's out. And of those two that are left, which one looks better, right? And then you make your move. So what alternatives do we have to d take c5? Okay, knight takes e4 is one of them. Any other moves? F3, F3 another one. And here in the chat they're suggesting castle queenside, basically saying actually you're not threatening anything, right? So, so let's take a look at knight takes e4, which is the only other capture, right? So obviously black's going to go knight takes and then it's sort of like 
playing a game of ping pong, the, the ball just came right back. Now we have to make another decision. The problem and the reason why f6 is a threat is that now having no pawn on e3, we can't really go knight g6 because our bishop's going to hang on f4, right? So, so that's really the underlying problem that's not allowing us to play the way we would normally want to play as white. So we need to somehow solve this problem. Bishop h2, and if I go f6? Uh, All right, so we didn't lose anything. That's the good news. But it looks like our pieces are getting pushed way, way back, right? For example, after bishop takes, uh, what were you going to take with here, the rook or the knight? Mm, probably knight. Knight takes, and let's say black realizes you know, his, his dream of playing e5. At the very least, this doesn't feel good right, for white. I'm not saying that, that white is completely losing or anything, but our king side looks terrible. g5 is off the table. Black got to play e5. I mean, the opening has been a disaster. And if you take with the rook, I don't, I don't think this is really going to change things too much. right? I still play e5. So you're on to the right idea. That's not the best move to make the most out, out of your idea. So your idea was, I have to defend this bishop, right? So that when f6 comes, this knight can also help to defend this bishop. Now, from f4, the knight is going to be able to defend the bishop, right? Once it goes uh, to g6. So the question would be, is there any other piece that can come to aid the bishop by defending it? That way, after f6, we can play our normal move, knight g6. Queen. Yes, queen e3. Right? And now, after f6, knight g6, the question is, well, does black have e5? And the answer is yes. Actually, black is doing pretty well here. I think after bishop h2, even though nothing terrible has happened, let's say you know, black just sort of uh, nurtures the position plays rook f8. We can castle. I mean, white's still alive here. Uh, I would say maybe black's a slightly better just because he, he won this tug of war over the e5 square, but, but white is very much still in this game. So that's a legitimate option, I would say, right? I mean, if now we have something that we can compare d takes c5 to, and that looks much better than d takes c5. So I would say, okay, d takes c5 is out. And um, knight takes e4 followed by, uh, by queen e3 looks like a legitimate option. The other move that we were talking about, right, was, was pawn to f3. Now, after pawn to f3, what happens if uh, simply knight takes? I remember during the game, I realized bishop takes is going to end in disaster, right? After bishop takes, pawn takes, black has queen takes. And again, you see this knight on c5 just uh, being devastating. This endgame should still be losing for white, uh, even though the structure is a little bit better than before. Um, yeah? Taking queen takes was also defend the bishop was inevitable. Yeah, so queen takes is kind of forced, but after f6, it's funny how, how black just doesn't care about d takes c5 ever. Um, so, so after knight g6, how would you guys uh, how would you guys play with black here? There's there's a key problem in this variation that we didn't have in the previous one. So it's black to play and win. Now we can just take on f4, right? Yes. 
And after knight takes? Yeah, right? Again, this, this knight on c5 is just such a nightmare for us. So, so black just wins. So we see that if we compare now knight takes e4 followed by queen e3 to f3, it seems like knight takes c4 is still the better choice. Now here in the chat, they're actually suggesting that this is not so bad if white just goes king takes d2. Now you have to be a very brave person um, to even consider king takes d2. But my question would be like, well, what happens if I just do this anyway? Right? You would have to take on c5 at this point. And uh, I would still go for something like bishop takes e5. Right? And after bishop takes, maybe f takes, and then just start working on this pawn. So again, this is not a position that uh, inspires a lot of confidence for white. So okay, you know, you had knight takes, d takes e5 is out, f3 is out, um, knight takes e4 seems to be our best candidate. The, the last remaining option is castle queenside. Now in the chat they're saying, well, king takes e2 might be an ugly position, but it's better than losing a piece, but it's not better than knight takes e4 followed by queen e3, right? So that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find something that's better than knight takes e4 followed by queen e3. Uh, because this has really become an exercise in, in calculation, right? In, in the move selection process. So after castle queenside, what would be the obvious move for black, the obvious follow-up? F6. Right, right, black wants to play f6. So what's going on here? What do we do? I don't think g6 is an option right now. No, right? Knight g6 is pretty much out because after bishop takes f4, I mean, what do you do? Knight takes maybe queen takes. You don't quite lose a piece, right? Because you can always take on c5. But I could maybe just take on f2. And uh, again, you know, your king site is falling apart. All right, so, and I mean here, you can't even take on b6, right? Because the queen's hanging. You can't take on f2 because then your rooks get forked. So things are looking pretty grim here. It looks like you're just going to lose this pawn next, right? Um, so that's game over. So we can't play our move. We can't play our knight g6 move. What else can we play? Yeah, in the chat they're saying you pretty much have to take on c5 at this point. And after bishop takes e5, bishop takes, queen takes. There's an important difference between this position and all the versions of d takes c5 followed by bishop takes e5 that we've been looking at. What is that difference? Why might this version be acceptable for white? This pawn? Yeah. Okay, so this pawn is still alive, but how are we going to deal with this situation here in the center? Another good point that's being made is that after f3, there's, there's no queen g3 check, right? So the key difference is that our king is already castled, right? We got our king out of the danger area. So not having to worry about our king's safety is, is a huge load lifted from our shoulders that allows us to focus on other things. Now f3, actually, there's a, there's a fundamental problem with f3, tactical one. And um, we've already encountered this idea. So how can black play? Knight g3. Knight g3. And uh, what if I take on e5? And uh, if I go rook g1, it looks like your knight escapes just in time. 
But let's say I go rook here, trying to go rook g2 next, right? It looks like this black knight is a bit off sides. So that's not it. Yeah, they got it here in the chat, right? This nasty knight on c5 solves all of... Well, I mean, you could go f takes, again, opening up the f file for the rook, or you could go knight b3, knight takes e5. In any case, um, black is just going to be winning in that endgame. So that's not solving our problems, right? We're just losing a pawn. So what can we do? If we go c6 right away, like, like you were saying, uh, I think this, this pawn has its, its days numbered, right? Maybe just knight c5 and uh, eventually just rook c8, rook takes c6. Okay, and let's say after pawn takes. Okay, and after pawn takes. King b1. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, this looks like maybe white's okay. It's a little scary to me to open up the A file like that. Um, especially if it's not forced, right? If I don't have to, I would try not to. Even if I don't see a clear refutation. Like, uh, instead of C takes B6, I was thinking maybe doing something like, like the idea you were mentioning there in the back, right? Now C6 looks much more interesting because the knight is gone, and uh, I can play it. Like if you go rook c8, I could go something like queen c4. Or maybe I could start with rook e1, saying, OK, let's, let's trade this one for this one, and I'll keep the a file closed. And if you go f5, you know, then I can maybe you know, take, go check, and now move my pawn forward. And the pawn is well supported, or at least well enough by the queen, so that if you go something like rook c8, I can maybe go rook g1, rook g6, rook d7, all of a sudden, you know, I have a plan. My pieces are, are getting active. So let's say if we take this position compared to the one after knight takes e4 and queen e3, those are, are really uh, two remaining options, right? So we have to weigh those two and decide which one we like more. So what would you guys do? Yeah, right? This position looks much better. It looks like you have much more to look forward to. And the other one, it seemed like you were just sort of uh, holding black off. But here, it seems like black also needs to be a little bit careful. So sure enough, uh, this was uh, the right move. Right? Castle queenside. And uh, unfortunately, this was not the move that I made. Uh, in the game, I played... Uh, I did play f3, and after knight takes d2, uh, queen takes d2, my opponent played f6, and here I just collapsed. Uh, I played d takes c5, and after bishop takes, c takes b6, a takes b6, and here I realized, originally, I had gone into this thinking, oh, bishop takes, queen takes, I can go queen e2, and this doesn't look that bad, right? Because if I trade queens, I survive. If he goes queen g3, uh, I think I was just going to go queen f2. And OK, it's nothing to write home about for white. But the problem was that I, I didn't realize how strong f takes e5 was especially with the open A file. Because let's say I go castle kingside. How would you guys play with black? How would you sketch out black's next few moves? All 
right? This is this is a problem, but this is also a very um, closely related problem as well, right? The backward pawn on f3, but the open king on g1. Yeah, so here, um, there are many ways of doing this. We have a suggestion in the chat, rook a4, followed by rook f4, and then e4, and everything just comes tumbling down. If white stops you from going rook a4 somehow, you can also just do rook f4, rook a f8. You're going to get the same position. Keep it simple. So this is just completely losing for white. Uh, that's why I had to go bishop e3, and now after bishop g3, I mean, I realized I wanted nothing to do with the king side, so uh, I made a run for it and played king d1. Uh, this was completely losing. I somehow managed to save this game, um, but I really, you know, uh, it's, you'll, you'll find this game in the database if you want to look for it, but it becomes like a pretty disgusting game uh, from here on out. So. I'm going to stop it here because for the purpose of today's discussion, you know, I wanted to talk about the London system. I wanted to talk about how super GMs are, are looking for subtleties early on in the game rather than, than engaging in this you know, shootout to see who has a better memory. And I think we made that point. So um, I'm going to stop here uh, just for the sake of my own dignity. but. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. So uh, thanks, guys, for, for coming and uh, for tuning into the lecture. Uh, and um, we'll be back again next week. All right. Thank you.